The following is a preview for an audiobook of The Gok Turks, Origin, Religion, and Rapid Rise of the First Turkic Empire, a historical book written by Emre E. Yavuz, the creator of Khan's Den. For Sabiha and Ainur, who always supported me with optimistic thoughts, balanced critique, and lifelong confidence, and to all naysayers who unknowingly motivated me to start this project in the first place, when Father Tengri created the blue sky above us and Mother Umay created the earth below us, the human race was created in between. Two of her sons were my ancestors, Bumin and Istemi. They became Kagans, rulers. People from all four directions were hostile to them, but they fought against them. Henceforth, those peoples had to bow their heads and bend their knees. The Kagans were wise and fearless. They ruled over all the kingdoms of the Turk people, the Turk nobility and the Turk people were united. Orkhan inscriptions. Prologue. The Altai Revolution. Picture it. The Eurasian Steppe Belt, 552 AD. It happened along the final frontier of civilization. The early morning began with an epic spectacle of nature. The yellow light of the everlasting sun shot in all directions, and made the vast, cool steppe shine in a strong and warm green color. Gradually, the life in this part of the world awoke from its sleep. It had even undergone deep catharsis in the eyes of some. The trees, mountains, rivers, and lakes suddenly did not seem as empty as during the silent night, as thousands of animals left their homes and went about the routine of their daily lives. And just like the eagles that were now scanning the earth from the sky for food, and the lions that sought to protect the well-being of their children from enemies, the family of this man who had taken to the cliffs and enjoyed the natural spectacle of sunrise to the fullest also began to pursue its destiny. After a long time of hiding, waiting, and struggling, he was finally able to take a deep breath and relax. He was like a wolf who had broken away from the pack and had tried to go his own way but he bagged one success after another, so that after some time the other wolves had caught up with him and joined his wolf pack. Now he was the new leader. All the hardships he had gone through had been worth it. The young man, who according to legend descended from a wolf, stood at the beginning of a new chapter in the history of his people. For the wolves of his pack were both his family as well as his subjects. He was both liberator and ruler. Booman had finally arrived at his destination. He was now king of the Turks. In the year 552 after the birth of Christ, 4,313 after the beginning of the human age of the Hebrew calendar, and 71 years before Muhammad went to holy Medina, something had happened in the inconspicuous lands of the vast steppes of Central Asia that would perhaps shape world history as strongly as those known events. An event of which at first only few had gotten wind. So far away from the countries of the so-called sedentary peoples, a gigantic golem could have come to life and move whole mountains, one would not have noticed. But the surrounding nations of Asia and Europe, the kingdoms and empires of the Chinese, Koreans, Persians, and Byzantines, would learn soon enough of the arrival of a new species of ruler. The history of the Turks had just begun, and what has once run its course cannot be stopped. Someone put a hand on Bumin's shoulder. We partied all night and you're up so early again. I really admire you, big brother. There's not much to it, Istemi. Besides, I don't think much of these drinking excesses. Why not? Returned Istemi with a sneer. But Booman was serious. Because there's still a lot of work to do. Any kind of fest would only hinder us in advancing further. Istemi looked his older brother in the eye. He had fought with Booman in the great war of liberation against Anagui's lackeys and had personally seen him in action. The other fighters, most of whom had volunteered from all over the country to overthrow Anagui, had been exhausted by the battles. But Bumin's drive knew no bounds. As much as Istemi admired his older brother, he was in awe of this mighty leader. He knew that Bumin wanted more than to free their own clan from the oppression of the foreigners. Bumin wanted much more. He always spoke of the Turk Bodin, the people of the Turk. Although this was the name for his own tribe called Ashina by the Chinese, by definition he included more than just his own little dynasty. Many Turkic clans in Asia, including the tribe of Bumin and Istemi, led a life as semi-nomads, with permanent residences, but moving to the cooler north or warmer south of the steppe, depending on the season. 
They maintained contact with traders from China and Iran, but always pursued their own conflicts. Often the Turks, just like other peoples of the steppe before and after them, were concerned with bare survival. However, the clans that lived in the Altai Mountains had a somewhat easier life than those in Western Asia, as they were in active contact with other peoples and thus could share in the trade of the Silk Road. They did not control the trade, but exchanged highly bred horses from the steppes for silk, wool, and jewelry from other countries, especially China. The Turks in the Altai Mountains were led by Bumin's clan, and so they had been the first to successfully gain their independence from Anagui. Neither the Mongols, nor the Chinese, nor even the Persians could now rule over the Turks, dictate them how much to eat and drink, what clothes to wear, or what language to speak. Bumin had grown up under these degrading conditions. His Ashina family belonged to the aristocracy in the country, yet was still under the command of Anagui, and powerless against the latter's henchmen. Bumin and Istemi rose early to the leaders of their clan, and were now directly subordinate to the ruler of the Ruran. On the orders of Anagui, Bumin had put down several revolts of other tribes that were also subject to the Ruran. Even though it didn't seem like it, Bumin was gathering new soldiers for his command through every battle he won, increasing prestige and fame for his political career with each victory. It had looked as if he was about to crush the new rebellions on Anagui's behalf. But in 546, the time had come. Bumin would take the next step. At last, he would climb the career ladder. For putting down the uprising of the Tiel, with whom the Ashina were probably related, he dared to go to his liege lords and demanded more than just gold and material from them as a reward. Bumin had put on his battle armor and was in the palace of Anagui Kagan. Although he should have shown reverence before his liege lord, the young Turk stood tall and radiated all his pride. Well then, you have truly done a great job, Bumin. I never doubted your abilities for a second, said the visibly aged Kagan. Anagui sat on a gilded throne and had called his closest advisors to him. Next to him, his bodyguard had taken up position. Not unusual for a coward like him, Bumin thought. But Anagui got right down to business. And what brings you to me? My Kagan, exclaimed Bumin. As you know, I have spared no effort to end the uprising of the traitorous Tiel. This has not only burdened me financially, but claimed the lives of many of my men. My family is in the process of wounding those who were injured. And you want me to provide you with gold and medicine? Yes, my lord. I'll grant that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anagui. Calling the Kagan by his first name, a faux po, as the advisors noted, but precisely planned by Bumin. A few moments passed. The Turk still stood in front of his liege. Is there anything else? Anagui wanted to know from his vassal, visibly irritated. Bumin said slowly, Indeed, I think I'm entitled to something more. And what would that be? The hand of your only daughter. Anagui widened his eyes, rose from his throne, and shouted so loudly at his vassal that the whole hall quite literally shook. You are just a blacksmith and my slave. How dare you utter these words? Anagui's advisors tried to calm him down, but when they turned their eyes to Bumin, they discovered a smile on his face. As you wish, shouted the Turk, addressing not only Anagui but also his bodyguard. These elite soldiers got into position in case of escalation, but it did not come to an escalation yet. We have put up with your shenanigans and arrogance long enough. It's time to put an end to it. With these words, Bumin turned his back on Anagui, the throne, and the entire Rorin elite, and left the palace. He had gone alone before his ruler, leaving his own Turk bodyguards waiting outside. Istemi was also there. We're leaving already? He asked his brother, puzzled. Yes, Bumin agreed. But we will be back and we will be numerous. With these words, Bumin rode toward the horizon. The setting sun cloaked the bodies of the Ashina soldiers in a red-black shadow. The bodyguard of Anagui had run after them. But when they saw the silhouette of these confident Turks riding away toward the sunset, their own fate dawned on them. If you were holding a historical novel in your hands, or rather, listen to it right now, this is how its story would have started. A novel that tells the story of two nomadic warriors who advanced from leaders of their tribe to rulers of the entire steppe. But such a novel does not exist. 
at least not in professional form, and certainly not on the international book market in the English language. The illustration of the so-called Gokturks in novel form, we will address the concept of that term, literally heavenly Turks, a bit later is probably too demanding, since there is also no factual model in form of an actual reference book, which would have processed the rise and fall of the Gokturks in its entirety. That is probably why you are listening to my audiobook at this moment. You have either long wanted a work about the mysterious dynasty of the Ashina family, or you came across this book by chance and found its premise quite interesting. Whichever side you are on, I assure you that this work was written for both laymen and experts of Turkic history. But first things first, what's the deal with these Gokturks anyway? The story of Bumin and Istemi is legendary, yet little known in the non-Turkic world. These two young men, descendants of the Turkic-speaking Ashina clan, defeated the armies of the Rurin Emperor and led the Turkic people to liberty in 552 CE. Their story is not invented at all. The characters of our little scene a minute ago did exist. The only thing that I added was the dialogue. The term Turk initially referred to their own clan during the lifetime of Bumin and Istami, but later also meant all other tribes and federations of the steppe that spoke a Turkic language and had been followers of Tengri. The Rurin, feudatories of the Ashina and all other Turks, were probably of proto-Mongol origin. They ruled over much of the Eurasian steppe beyond the territory of present-day Mongolia, with Kazakhstan as a buffer zone between their empire and Europe. Further south, in neighboring China, they traded with and fought against emperors who were of Turkic descent, but had become virtually completely Sinicized, meaning that they had completely absorbed Chinese languages, tradition, and state doctrine. The largely nomadic Turks of the steppe therefore lived under foreign rule by the Rurun, in a comparatively unfriendly region of the earth, that is, until the arrival of Bumin. When Bumin led the Ashina to war against the Rurun, he also mobilized the Tiel, whom he had previously conquered himself. This Eurasian nomadic federation also consisted of Turkic tribes. If we add all the other smaller tribes that lived in the Rurin area, the reason for the overthrow of the Rurin is self-evident. With the death of Anagui Kagan, who took his own life after the defeat against Bumin, ended the foreign rule in the land of the Turkic peoples, as the Turkic-speaking groups of late antiquity are collectively called in contemporary academia. This collection of semi-nomads then experienced for the first time what it meant to live in liberty, economically and culturally, but above all politically, because the term Turk could be applied to many different ethnic groups in Asia. From the Caspian Sea in the west to the Korean Peninsula in the east of Asia, Turks were scattered everywhere. The political unification of all these people under the banner of the Ashina tribe or any other family had never happened before. Bumin's success was a cultural revolution. The Turks of that time, however, were living quite differently from the Turks as we imagine them as inhabitants of Anatolia nowadays. As should begin to dawn on you, my Turks are not the Turks you have in mind. There are two obvious reasons for this. First, my Turks lived in the Eurasian steppe belt, not in Anatolia and Thrace. Second, they were not sedentary, but semi-nomadic. Most of their tribes led a modest existence in mostly barren landscapes of the steppes, whether as hunter-gatherers, farmers, traders, or mercenaries. These early Turks, as they are also called, had neither been numerous nor a significant part of the Asian political establishment. There had not even been an officially Turkic nation until Bumin's revolution. The Xiongnu, often referred to as the Asian Huns, had incorporated some Turkic tribes into their empire, but whether the Xiongnu leaders themselves were also Turks is not known, only that the political elite spoke an early form of Turkic. This would certainly suggest that the Xiongnu were Turks or early Turks for that very reason. After all, this assumption coincides with the common definition of a Turk, that someone who learned a Turkic language as a native speaker and grew up with Turkic traditions or whose parents are Turks is ultimately a Turk and may be called such but was only one possibly influential part of the Xiongnu Turkic? Or did the great leaders of the Huns like Tuman and Mautun, called Teoman and Mete Han in Turkic, see themselves as Turks or belonging to the Turkic cultural sphere? 
Well-known greats of Turkology and other scientific disciplines relevant for this analysis, such as Shiratori, have spoken out in favor of this claim. Others, like Pritzak, see at least overlaps between the Hunnic and Turkic languages. Golden points to a likelihood of Turkic elements among the Xiongnu and considers the ancient Turkic language a connecting element between Xiongnu and the Huns in Europe. There are also counter-arguments, for example by Shimunek, who considers a classification of the Hunnic language impossible, and by Jankowski, who suggests an Iranian origin of the Xiongnu. The Xiongnu Empire should be classified as a federation of many tribes and less as a tightly run empire, although there were autocratic structures that held the state together. In any case, it had at times posed a serious threat to the sedentary Chinese, whose attacks to the north had brought about the federation in the first place. Again, the Chinese had built parts of the famous Great Wall to deter the tribes of the Xiongnu Federation from invading northern China. After a successful foreign policy of divide and conquer, the legendary Chinese Han Dynasty was able to divide the Xiongnu first into two, then into four smaller splinter groups and partly conquer the southern tribes. By the first century CE, the Xiongnu influence had declined rapidly. Nevertheless, descendants of the steppe peoples successfully established new states along the border with China. Among them were tribes belonging to the Turkic-speaking group. As a side effect of sorts, the dissolution of the Xiongnu and infighting between the tribes had triggered the emigration of numerous Turkic tribes and clans to the west. Therefore, in the period between 200 and 500 CE, that is, after the end of the Xiongnu and before the start of the Gokturks era, ethnic groups appeared in the Caspian Sea and even in Ukraine that spoke a Turkic language. Some of these Turks were almost isolated from world events in the wilderness of the Central Asian steppes. No authority existed above them except Tengri, except God but many tribes put themselves, rather involuntarily, in the service of dukes and kings of other ethnic groups. In the process, these Turkic peoples came into active contact with the Eastern European, Caucasian, Iranian, and Chinese cultural spheres. This also explains the complexity of the Turkic peoples in their appearance. We may imagine the early Turks— that is, before the beginning of the Gokturks era, as people with rather flat faces, flat noses, and almond eyes. According to outdated representations of the European division of the world into races, these Turks would have been mongoloid, although I must stress that this term was applied the peoples of Central Asia only because all steppe peoples were commonly thought of as Mongols, or related to Mongols by European scholars. As we will see, Turks and Mongols did have a common origin which dates 9,000 years back in time, when they were living in harmony side by side with the ancestors of the Koreans and Japanese in a common ancestral homeland. However, the influence of Mongolian culture and the early form of Mongolian language was not as dominant as in the time of Genghis Khan in the Middle Ages. Whereas even in the time of the great Mongol Empire in the 13th century, the Turks held great influence in the empire and, for example, made up a considerable part of the Mongol army. Because of the de facto fusion of Mongolian and Turkic traditions and languages, the term Turco-Mongol is popular today for that time period. But for the era that is the subject of this book, Late Antiquity, the term does not seem useful. Language aside, however, all early Turks had one thing in common, a trait they shared with the early Mongols. They were excellent warriors. Their mounted archers were keeping with the tradition of all steppe peoples, dating back to the time of Alexander the Great. In the often barren steppes, the strongest, toughest, and bravest warriors in the world were born and literally grew up on horseback, a Chinese scholar once remarked. He was not wrong. The history of the Turks prior to the Mongol Empire is the best proof of this claim. It is true that the history of this cultural group does not begin with the Ashina dynasty, with Bumin and Istami. But it was not until the middle of the 6th century that Turkic acquired a unique identity, which was internalized by the Khagans, Begs, and Shads of the Ashina Empire, and nationalized at the political level, thereupon expanding in all four directions. For Bumin and Istemi's ambitions had been only half fulfilled with the liberation from Roran rule. Their second goal was to integrate all the remaining Turkic ethnic groups on the continent of Eurasia into their empire, 
and accordingly to expand their influence as far as possible. Therefore, shortly after the founding of the empire, the Ashina armies came into contact and obviously conflict with the great sedentary peoples of late antiquity, the Chinese, Koreans, Persians, and Byzantines. And so this new empire, which shall henceforth be called the Khaganate of the Gokturks, stretched from Manchuria and Korea in the east across Mongolia and Central Asia to what is now Ukraine in the west, from Siberia in the north to Afghanistan and Tibet in the south. Their cognate became so powerful that one of them even used to call the Chinese emperors his sons. A certain Chinese empress even had to pay the Kagan enormous sums of silk as tribute, and the Byzantine emperor courted the favor of the steppe warriors in his conflict with the Persians. A Kaganate is a large steppe empire whose ruler, the Kagan, lays claim to rule over all the steppe peoples. It is therefore equivalent to an empire according to ancient conception. A Khanate, on the other hand, is a kingdom whose ruler, the Khan, could simply lay less claim to power over events in the steppe area. Therefore, a Khaganate stood above a Khanate geopolitically. By the way, the titles Khagan and Khan are called Hakan and Han in Turkic. Later, the designation of Khagan became obsolete, which is why Temujin is known to us as Genghis Khan and not Genghis Khagan. All along the periphery, the Gokturks remained sovereign for some three decades, each new generation of princes and princesses even more ambitious than the last. The Ashina coveted world domination, it seemed, but all great empires in human history have a humble beginning, and every great empire must eventually perish. As already noted, the Turks of antiquity had been neither numerous nor politically prominent. How on earth, then, did the Gokturks manage to become so powerful and influential in the first place? Why did they come into conflict with their sedentary neighbors whom they used to trade with? What were the reasons for their rapid demise, hostile invasions, climate change, or indeed treachery? And why, prior to the purchase of this book, have you never heard of these celestial Turks? It is time to get to the bottom of these and other important questions of ancient Turkic and Asian history. There is a long and arduous way ahead. Well, arduous was only the research of the author. I started conducting research as a young student away from my studies in history, and year after year I gathered new knowledge, which I would now like to share with you. You are about to embark on a journey through time to a world full of contradictions and absurdities, to an era of warriors, adventurers, and traitors, to a land whose inhabitants drew new strength from the suffering of their ancestors for a better, safer future. You, dear reader, need not worry about overcoming any hardships while reading on. I will not flood you with unnecessary information, nor will I tell you half-truths. Both sides of the same coin must be explained. I will accompany you and be your guide. Let us now dive into the almost forgotten homeland of all Turkic peoples, Central Asia.